Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, this is a Microscopist Africa special. We're going to meet with Karen Jacobs of the University of Cape Town, with Mahmoud Mena from Yobi State University of Nigeria and University of Sussex, and Ben Luz of University of Stellenbosch. And they are going to discuss their experiences in building microscopy communities. A lot of our sort of linchpins are primarily early career researchers who see this as something that they want to be involved in because it's a space that they want to build their career in. Funding challenges for microscopy across Africa. It's challenging to bring in the funds even for the upkeep of the utilizations. And the lack of access to core equipment. In Nigeria, I think um, when we launched this center by RTC, we have the only, you know, confocal microscope in the entire country. All in this very special edition of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from University of York and welcome today to The Microscopist and a special African bioimaging version of this. And today I have three guests, which is one more than I think we've ever tried before. So actually we have Mahmoud, we have Ben, we have Karen, uh, all representing different initiatives uh, for bioimaging in Africa itself. And it'd be really fascinating to hear about their careers, how it's progressed, but what, where they see bioimaging going, where they wanted to get to, and what the challenges are that still have to be resolved to get to where they want to get to. I think that's, so that's the general gist for today. So anyway, Mahmoud, Karen, Ben, how are you all today? Hi. <laughs> Lots good. of thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, good. Um, I, I'm, I'm always happy when I hear that uh, we've achieved a new record. So if we're one more than you've had previously, that's good news. I, it is. And I think because it's a African imaging special. Uh, I wanted to get representation to three very different initiatives. Uh, so actually, do you know what maybe the best thing to do is if I ask you very succinctly, just to describe what your initial initiative is about, what are you trying to achieve? So I'm going to start with Karen in the first instance. Cool, no pressure. Um, so I guess I'm mainly representing what's called the African Bioimaging Consortium or ABIC which started about 19 months ago, officially a year and a half, 19 months ago, and with the idea of uh, establishing a community and a network for researchers in Africa with an interest in microscopy and bioimaging um, to get them connected with each other, overcome a sense of isolation, and build a community and uh, improve capacity of the continent. A lot has come out of that that I could talk on, but I won't. (laughs) Yes. Uh, okay, we'll come back to the questions. And Mahmoud next. Okay, um, I guess uh, for this podcast, I'll be speaking, um, you know, or representing the uh, Biomedical Science Research and Training Center at Yoga State University. Um, and this uh, center was launched uh, in 2021. And the general idea is that, um, you know, we do... we. We don't have we don't have the infrastructure for a kind of imaging and for research generally and uh, you know we came up with this plan in collaboration with the you know government and the scientists to launch this center which is now having some of the only cutting edge equipment like a confocal so I guess I'll be speaking uh, from that perspective. Okay, Mamu, thank you, and finally Ben. Yes, hi Pete. So I'm uh, representing the South African bioimaging community. Uh, I'm a microscopist myself since many, many years, and so we are on this journey to uh, to facilitate utilization of, of primarily light microscopy techniques across uh, the South African landscape, and there are, of course, many exciting opportunities, uh, but also many challenges, and so, yeah. So, so that, that's an interesting point to start with. Uh, <clears throat> your own bioimaging. You're all light microscopy, if I've just heard correctly. Do any of you incorporate electron microscopy into that bioimaging side? Um, I 
guess I can jump in. Um, so ABIC uh, has started with a bias towards light microscopy, uh, mainly due to the interests of the people who've gotten involved from the get-go, but we are not exclusive with light microscopy at all. Uh, we're looking at how to expand towards um, electron microscopy. There's actually, a, there is a presence for electron microscopists in bioimaging on, on the continent. And then we're linked with uh, biomedical researchers as well, but our, our focus is more than microscopy. But yeah, we have a bias, but uh, we're trying to work on it. Yeah. Okay. Just... Uh, what, go, 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 quick question though. Sure. Is that bias because the, the light microscopy was already talking together better maybe than the electron microscopy community? Uh, or is there, are there more light microscopy communities? Why do you think that bias is there to start with? Um, I, I think it's the interest of those of us who sort of got this rolling in off, off the ground and also a perception that it is a easier field to get people into imaging at the side. It's much easier to teach people how to use a basic light microscope or a wide field than a TEM. Um, so it, it's kind it's kind of both those things that we, we see the potential for, for light microscopy and the impact in research. And it's not really something that's heavily used in research in Africa, and it's teachable. Um, the interesting flip side, if we start to get into the sort of existing infrastructure in, if, in Africa, is that there are a number of electron microscopes across the, the continent, primarily used for material sciences. Uh, that means that there is an EM community and there are researchers with easier access to EM. So that's why we're, we're trying to work out how to, um, get them into the fold and <laughs> sort of make, make ourselves more applicable to them. Um, I know, for example, within South Africa, there are quite a few researchers using uh, TEM and SEM for bioimaging that we uh, are not yet in contact with, but I think Ben is. So I think that's an interesting point. You, you mentioned the, the there's a lot in the material world for electron microscopes. And is that because of the, the mining industries? And the amount of uh, industrial income coming to help and the research put into that because of the, the again, it's exactly infrastructure for the countries themselves. Is, is that? I, I I think it's exactly that. And uh, depending on how political you want to get, I think that's also strongly linked to the colonial history of the continent in terms of resource extraction and that sort of thing. That that's a space that industry more easily invests in on the continent. So as bioimages, you need to go and uh, muscle into their electron microscopes and start using the bio side. Uh, well, I, I think slowly people are. Um, and we're just trying to convince them that sort of a good wide field and a, a good confocal uh, are, are useful too, because you can actually do things that, you can image things that move, which you can't do on an electron microscope to start with. You know, confocals are really good for materials as well. So actually... <laughs> from that Good side point. and start seeing things they may not have been realized they could do so easily uh, Mahmoud you yeah. were going to say something I apologize no it's all right um I just wanted to I uh, say that um I think uh from uh, my perspective especially you know looking at Nigeria you will say that when we talk about by imaging people mostly think about uh, light microscopy because the infrastructure is not existent for let's say electron microscope um, I could remember, I, you know, in my undergraduate days, um, I was shown an electrons microscope but that stopped working like probably two decades before I joined the university. Um, and uh, I am aware of researchers also, you know, going outside Nigeria to other countries to image their grids. So I think, uh, you know, we, the bias could also be due to the lack of the available infrastructure for electrons microscopy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Ben, is that similar for yourself? Yeah, so on the one hand, it's true there's a very strong material science background since many years due to that industry uh, utilization. But life sciences has kind of come in. There is a strong work on rheology, blood-related diseases. And what we have been um, busy with in the last two years um, is through the correlative field to bring in a TEM and so correlative uh, microscopy. Um, and that is, of course, um, yeah, a, a growing field that connects these two communities. 
I think generally TEM, of course, diagnostics. Uh, so most of our TEMs are also embedded in the diagnostics uh, systems and not so strongly uh, in the you know in the academic institutions. I think it's starting to change through the through the CLEM approaches. Well, I, I think CLEM correlative light electron microscopy. It's always good to make a lighter work of electron microscopy. Sorry, I should... getting late in the day over here. So a, a good pun <laughs> is always worth it. <laughs> I, 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 I enjoyed that. <laughs> I would say I'm a serial offender, but maybe I'm just a serial sectioner when it comes to electron microscopy. Anyway, I, I will digress. So the next bit I need to really bring up is how is it all being funded for the initiatives? There's one thing having your research funded, which we'll come to in a minute. But what about these initiatives? Who is supporting these initiatives? Companies, charities, governments? Uh, and I'm going to start, I'm going to go the opposite way this time. I'm going to start with you, Ben. Yeah, so, so the South African bioimaging uh, community is uh, pretty much uh, very poorly funded. Uh, we have interest, we have interest by users, and we have interest by our, um, our partners in, in industry. So the microscope partners and, and, and uh, reagents and so forth. But unfortunately, strategically, there is no funding for, you know, for, for upkeep of uh, the community with administration and so forth. I think, Pete, we are also still in kind of in, uh, in baby steps there. So we are still in the process to create that awareness and, and bring that to the attention of the respective governmental structures. But at the moment, it is completely driven on a voluntarily base next to the next to your main job, basically. Yeah, and I say so, so. Obviously, in Europe, well, internationally, we have the Royal Microscopical Society, but it's very UK centric still at the moment. But it is there to help and support outside. But actually, looking at a lot of other initiatives, even in Europe, a lot of it does start with the volunteers. You know, and actually, I think that's a big message for anyone listening. A lot of societies. Are completely dependent upon volunteers putting their time and efforts in to help the community develop uh, and that's not to be forgotten so I think it's great because that's where it all starts it has to start both from the ground upwards and the ground is us it's the volunteers that step up to it. Uh, Mahmood what about yourself in, in Nigeria how is that funding panning out for the for the network side and the training and the training center? Um, so uh, as a center, we are embedded in a university. So, uh, and uh, because of that, we have a structure that was given by the university to use. Um, but uh, because we, you know, this is, you know, we just started uh, a few, uh, you know, last year, there are a lot of things that needs to happen before we can fully become like, um, you know, an, uh, in a robust center, you know, doing research uh, and supporting the community. And to be honest, most of what we do at the moment, uh, you know, is through our links with Trend in Africa. Uh, Trend in Africa is an NGO that I'm part of. I'm, uh, I'm a coordinator in Trend in Africa. And through that links, we have volunteers, again, that are on paid supporting some of the activities that we do in terms of, you know, either providing mentorship or uh, providing, let's say, some high-end training or is even sending equipment to the center. But talking of that, we are kind of um, lucky to have funding, for example, when we started this from Welcome Trust, and then we got a funding from the Chan uh, for in initiative, which really enabled us to fully, you know, get on with what we want to do in terms of training, in terms, you know, the next generation, supporting other people to have access to image and ETC. And this funding is for three years, so we are not worried at the moment, but we know that uh, beyond that, we have to start thinking about, uh, you know, what to do to ensure we, you know, sustainability. Okay, thank you, Mahmoud. And uh, Karen, I think similar for Chan Zuckerberg, but other funders, other uh, no, so similar to um, Ben's description, ABIC started as 
a volunteer sort of it actually snowballed I think at a much greater rate than those of us who first got involved expected it to uh, which is a great problem to have um, but we started with no funding we were fortunate to get CZI funding in the same round as Nomad's initiative with their expanding global access to bioimaging um, call uh, and they that's been uh, hugely instrumental in allowing us to get people together um, in person and um, we'll, we've got some other um, travel opportunities that will be funded. We'll, we're announcing them in January and they'll be funded by the CCI grant. Um, we do also have funding for a coordinator which will help um, a lot of it'll alleviate the burden of a lot of what a lot of the current volunteers are, are doing. But um, a lot of the key activities are actually not the sort of thing that takes money. It takes time. It's maintaining a, a website, which a coordinator can, can assist with, but it's kind of feeds into uh, a lot of what South Africa by imaging um, sort of how it operates in terms of it's just volunteer time, which has been an interesting and it's unexpected challenge to, communicates to the community sometimes. I think because there's such an intense hunger and need from the community for support that they see anything formal looking and are immediately expecting something with much greater powers than we have. And it's taken a lot to communicate that we're a volunteer organization and you, you can get involved too, but we don't have magic powers. <laughs> um, but uh, for there's all, power in numbers. <laughs> yeah, so, so for all of you, we're the volunteers. The there's a lot of well-meaning volunteers that will volunteer and they'll be full of good ideas. How do you actually get the right sorts of people, not just to have the good ideas, but to actually see the ideas through and actually delivering those? Has that been easy or is that only a select few that actually step up and deliver what the ideas are and actually proactive in, in whatever it is, the administration, the contacts, whether it's website, whatever it is. How have you found that? Uh, Mahmoud first, maybe. We'll go a different order. Yeah, I guess uh, for, for me, <clears throat> because when we talk about the BIPC our center, you kind of look at it as an initiative, but also as an infrastructure for research. So it's kind of like having two things at a time, uh, especially because we were funded by the CZI to form this uh, kind of uh, network in West Africa. So from the network point of view, um, I think, um, people are quite excited to volunteer. We have a coordinator paid for by from the CCI funding, but we need more than that to be able to do this, the kind of things that we are doing or we want to do. Uh, so we've got a lot of volunteers through Trend in Africa who have been doing things in African continent anyway, uh, you know, voluntarily. So they are quite keen on doing it. And especially they see this initiative that we have as something that would, uh, that they can easily used to uh to major impact because in the past what we used to uh, what we used to do in training africa is to organize a workshop let's say in uganda in tanzania in south africa or other places but here we have a center that is domiciled in one institution so you can easily count the number of people going in there to use the facility you can easily know a lot of different things so from that perspective having volunteers that are passionate to do it has come has been easy but from the angle of now the training part or the you know, center itself, because we're in an institution, which is a new university that was launched like uh, 20 years ago, I think now. So uh, there are a lot of things that, um, you know, challenges that we are going through. For example, the infrastructure, the, you know, the, you know, the scientists or researchers that have the capacity to use the facility that we have brought to the, to the institution. And I think not just that institution, I think this is something more general across Nigeria as well. So for example, we have about four staff in the center, one senior staff, and then three tech, tech, uh, technologies. And uh, all of these, with the exception of the senior staff, they need training. Two of them are coming to York to get into the job sharing program. So I think from that angle, we are a, a, a little bit you know, uh, struggling, but they are all passionate. So that is one good thing about it. And the institution is also very supportive in terms of providing some dedicated funds and stuff like that to support them. I, I tell you what, having had a couple of weeks with me, Mahmoud, I'll be glad to get home. <laughs> this... Thank you. <laughs> 
be, they should be warned. <laughs> it's quite <laughs> a crazy madhouse sometimes up in York. Uh, and Karen, is it similar, getting people to deliver uh, what their ideas are? Yeah, we, um, we, most of our activities come from a core group of active people, but it's, um, it's been exciting to see how recently we've grown. One of the ways that, again, because as we speak to people, there's this, we get ideas and requests thrown at us all the time. Um, what has helped us a lot is that when we started, we actually started with a community meeting of sort of people that we knew that we, we got about 18, 20 researchers um, in a Zoom call and had a long discussion about what, what people saw was needed by the community. And from that, we kind of pieced together a remit uh, for this network that we wanted to, to, to start. And a lot of this work was done by uh, myself and my colleague, Michael Reiki, who's uh, been fantastic to work on this. And we sort of gave ourselves very clear points. Like um, our big thing was we didn't want to replicate effort done by other initiatives. So we're aware of a bunch of uh, training initiatives that Mike and I are actually involved in separately. So we didn't want to be another training initiative, for example. We obviously don't have the capacity to be a funding um, program. So we kind of whittled it down to what can we do in building the community? And we gave ourselves key goals. And um, at least until we feel like we've achieved those goals and the community says, actually, now we really do need this next thing and if that next thing is we want you to start a, a massive workshop program <laughs> we'll see if we do that but and, until then we've got this remit that we uh it helps us to work in but um aside from that it, it is sort of just getting people in who have have the, the the challenges the capacity uh from people to to work on this so covid oddly enough was um a bit of a windfall for us in terms of African researchers up until then did not routinely work online. All of a sudden, we were all used to working on Zoom. So getting people into regular Zoom calls was uh, uh, not a challenge, whereas a year prior it would have been. Um, but a lot of the volunteer networks um, elsewhere in the world um, are supported by core facility staff to a large extent or, or other enthusiasts. Without uh, Africa doesn't have a lot of core facility core facilities in general. So we don't have core facility staff who can say this is, I can justify spending my time on this, which means that a lot of our um, sort of um, linchpins are primarily early career researchers who see this as something that they want to be involved in because it's a space that they want to build their career in as opposed to a large PI or some, someone like that. So we, we, we've, we've got some firecrackers in, in the group and a lot of other people who kind of come and go as they've got capacity and both are fantastic. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, I think that's, that's a good enough answer. No, yeah, that's pretty good. I'm just thinking about the, the philosophy, uh, the culture of core facilities. Uh, I, I would say back in the UK 20 years ago, you know, it wasn't yeah. a culture of core facilities. And in 20 years, almost no one, almost, there are a few, but the majority of the high-end microscopes, electron microscopes, light microscopes, flow cytometers, mass spectrometers are now in core facilities with dedicated core staff. So it happens really fast, uh, especially when the funders. Key thing is once the funders realize how much more impact their funds can be to, yeah, their funds can be leveraged if it goes into a core facility Absolutely. rather than an independent academic lab. And it's getting that shift. I, I think it'd be very hard now in the UK to get funding to buy your own confocal microscope or your mm. transmission electron microscope or super resolution light sheets, whichever it is. Mm. It's hard to get an individual to get one in their own lab now. It, it, it's almost mm. all. 20 years ago, that was much less the case. But now, now it's right over because obviously we all know everyone can use them then. It, it opens up the access to those who, who can't do that by just themselves. Yeah step up in their their academic careers and ben what about yourself for the south africa yeah. i think i think um you know the pain connects you know uh, the, the we are we're sitting with the same pains you know the the pis the students and we are quite privileged in a sense you know we do have yeah at sandwich university we have a very good imaging facility but the pains of you know are we globally competitive? What are we aligned? Are our protocols sound? 
that's for us. But then for the student, you know, then we think, of course, how bad must it be then for, you know, the institution that is, you know, remote, that is, you know, a former teaching institution now has to suddenly do research and doesn't know where to start. And then we think of the poor students, you know, that miss out. So those that stick with us are those that feel that same pain and just want to make a change for that. And, and that's quite nice, you know, that anchors and brings together and um, is robust. And, you know, I hope that's, that, that, that sees us through. Yeah, I, I think you're tapping on students is really important too, because it's not just early career postdocs, it's those PhDs coming through that are looking to improve their CVs. And actually, these networks, by, by, by default, they improve their own network, which imp improves mm -hmm. their chance of getting their next postdoctoral position because they have contacts, networks, they get known, they get a feel for a wider view than just what's going on in their own lab. So students are a really great resource. I'm going to mix it up a bit because we've, we've been quite serious up to now. You sent me some pictures, all of you. <laughs> uh, so I, I've, I've kind of randomized oh, yeah. on Zoom. So I, I, you're going to have to tell me what they are and who they're from. So first one is this one. Ooh, okay. <laughs> so whose picture that, is that? That's mine. Um, oh, so sorry. that is, yeah, that is the the cohort of the latest Imaging Africa workshop that we had that was run uh, mid-October, end of October this year. So that is, you're seeing a mixture of faculty. Um, most of the faculty was either local or from the Advanced Imaging Center in Geneva. For anyone watching, you'll recognize a few familiar faces in there, I think. There's Leon in the middle. Yeah. Um, and then the rest is uh, 24 students um, exclusively from around Africa. Uh, so the Imaging Africa workshop is targeted exclusively to African um, students and early career researchers um, and to make sure that cost is not a barrier to access. All expenses are paid for all selected students. So that, that was a, a great cohort that we had there. You know what's really spooky? I've just noticed. So if, you, if you're listening to this, you're just going to have to imagine. It's a big group picture. And it's a Zoom, my Zoom background. But it's like I've got Leong just chatting away in my ear. Yes, he's yeah. just perched <laughs> there. Yeah, it's surreal because when you go to a conference, it's like Leong is just like this in your ear. Pete, you've got to do something here. You've got to do this. Because he's so <laughs> creative in his ideas and his thinking. Yeah. <laughs> so that's cool. Next picture is, God, which one should we do? This one. Well, that, this is actually, even I know this must be off you, Ben. Yes, that is. Uh, so the, the fun bit is that you can see I still had a beard at the time, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. I was told I'm looking too old with the beard. So, <laughs> so this is at a, at a conference a few years ago, and uh, some of my former students that all won prizes at this was at the microscopy conference, EMSA, which is our academic conference here in South Africa. It happens every second year now in December. And these students, I'm just so proud of them. They've been, you know, they're all successful. Uh, Jürgen on the left runs our first South African, African block phase SEM. Uh, Dumi uh, in the middle, she is at the Crick's Institute uh, in London, uh, working on a super exciting Clem kit project for, for Sabi, in fact. Um, and then on the right, uh, Yigal, also successful, all PhDs. So this was just a special moment it, it's you know this is the meaning also you know the motivation why we bring the technology in and some students love it and you know and spend all the time they have on the microscope drive it themselves and this is absolute joy for me to to see and you say is it doing you is it a crick was it so is that with lucy collinson or a collaboration with yes correct correct yes yeah, so lucy and i we've been collaborating since many years uh, in fact, she helped us uh, in baby steps to set up our CLEM process over the last years. And, and Dumi is there involved now in, uh, uh, in the, the management of a, this CLEM kit, uh, also a CZI-based uh, project, democratizing CLEM. And uh, being South African, she actually just recently welcomed the South African president over there at the Crick. So this is just super exciting things that are happening there uh, in this regard. You can see how this, ne this networking is going in big places then. And the yeah. final picture that I'll put up. Is... <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this, uh, this, uh, this was actually a picture uh, taken 
I think during one of our workshops in July, um, you know, with Hidayah and Suleiman. So uh, Suleiman is a research uh, technician in uh, in BRTC, and Hidayah is actually um, a PhD student at the University of Lorraine. Um, and because the way you know we organized the workshop, we said, okay, you know what? Uh, all students that want to attend this workshop have to have an ongoing project. Uh, you know, such that once they get trained with our equipment, they get to now continue using it for their project because oftentimes you see people come in and then they get the certificate and then they disappear. So Hidaya was one of the PA students that we selected because she has this exciting project, but she doesn't have, um, you know, the facility where she can, uh, you know, either image the samples or, you know, uh, use the flies or whatever they want to do. Uh, so we selected her and in this particular picture it's with the dissecting microscope um it's a shame that you can't show the other pictures where we have the confocal but generally uh you know the idea is that because we, with BRTC, you know we want to uh, it's more like a co-facility so all the students that get trained there or even after the summer school we get uh, we have these you know um applications that comes in rolling basis where people want to come there to run their projects or experiments and then use the facility. So this was like uh, a picture taken uh, during that workshop. And it's quite exciting because now we have them coming back to BRTC to continue uh, you know, their projects. So, so following a similar thing, so I'm just looking at the pictures that are all being sent. There's this one as well, which is <laughs> utterly different. So this is now <laughs> very young, very, very young children. Okay. Yeah. Getting tears in my eyes, Pete. <laughs> so these are my two boys, Joshua and Avon, oh, a few wow. years ago. And uh, they are, well, they are using at home microscopy to, to, to check out beetles and what, whatever they can find. And um, yeah, this is just uh, some, some fun at home. <laughs> That's super cool. And one more. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is you, Karen. Yes. Uh, so th that is me. I'm I'm sure I'm much bigger than Dean's. <laughs> but uh, that, that that that's with one of my toys. That is a um, Zeissi Lyra in our BSL three lab. So that's a super is microscope. It's a sim microscope that um, was purchased to allow researchers to use it for uh, pathogens like um, mycobacterial to mycobacterial tuberculosis, um, Plasmodium uh, HIV. Um, any other pathogens. It's not exclusive BSL-3, users can bring in non-pathogenic samples, but it's in the BSL-3 lab so that um, we can do some, some uh, more risky experiments on it. So is that way. an ELIRA-7? Yeah, no, 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 no. So this, we've had it for a few years, it's an ELIRA-S1. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah. So it's got SIM, but not SIM squared on it. Correct. So if SIS are listening, they should be thinking about giving you some SIM squared upgrades to support this. Well, we we have one of those in the the new facility, the the microscopy unit facility. So we're um, I won't say spoiled, but we're very fortunate to, to uh, for, for everything that we have. I think that chimes quite nice, nicely. Where I'd like to go next with this conversation to to actually get a feel for what infrastructure you actually have. Uh, firstly, on your own doorstep, so in your own institutes. Uh, and being as Kevin, you just mentioned, you got the yes one, and you got the Alive is seven. What else do you have? Okay. Um, I feel like I have to pre preface this with um, we are not a representative sample <laughs> of the, the South African or, or, or African infrastructure, which is why um, it, ours is accessible in, in the way it is. So um, we have two core facilities, and I'll try to whiz through this as quickly as possible, but we have two facilities. One is internal and that BSL-3 microscope is part of the internal facility, along with a screening microscope, also in BSL-3. It's a molecular devices system. And we've got an old Delta Vision uh, uh, a developmental light sheet um, supported by M squared lasers, as well as a stellar vision, which is an unusual one um, for spatial transcriptomics. And those are all accessible to local researchers, as well as anyone else who wants to come and use it. And then we have a new imaging center that was launched in October, which is based at UCT. And I'm fortunate that I, I have access to it. I, I help um, 
sort of run it to some extent with my colleague Mike, but it, it's a resource for the entire African continent, continent as it's part of the Africa Microscopy Initiative. So this, and is, at this, end, this is all of Africa, North, East, South, West. It's everyone in Africa. So we actually came up with the correct phrasing of how, how to describe this because uh, a few sort of in discussions with people, the way we've thrown it around has been met with some confusion. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to try this out uh, publicly for the first one now. This is accessible to um, any scientist in Africa doing not for profit research. Um, anywhere in Africa. Um, and one of the fantastic things about this facility is that um, it's accessible only through um, submitting a project proposal, but if you're invited based on your project proposal, travel and accommodation to visit is covered by our very how generous many, funders. How many visitors would that be per year? Because at the moment, this is sounding like utopia. And I'm, 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 <laughs> right. is it, well, I'm going to be quite confident it isn't utopia because... <clears throat> It's a very big continent. There's lots of researchers. So how to so that funding, I presume, is charity funded for people to come down, the travel bursaries uh, and the expenses. Uh, how, much, how many will that serve a year? Uh, with our current capacity, which is a combination of funds and staff to support it, we're looking at being able to support between um, 12 and 16 visitors for projects a year for up to four weeks. Um, that, that limitation, if we're at the upper limit, is actually the harder limit is staff to support and support visitors while they're here. Um, if, if anyone's listening and is interested in providing additional funding, then we can get more staff and pay for more travel and we can do more. <laughs> but um, to go back to your original question, sort of now that I've given the, the, the preface, we have um, five microscopes available that uh, researchers can access. One of them is study Lyra 7, and that's Latticem as well as Palm Storm. Um, we have a fully equipped um, wide field, auto, um, AD fluorescent microscope uh, equipped for live cell imaging and UV to, all the way through to near infrared. So we can uh, tackle a lot of unusual labels and uh, or pathogens, organisms uh, and samples on that. We have a LSM, so it's line scanning confocal 980, which is the latest generation with airy scan 2 and spectral demixing, um, as well as uh, what's called a cell discoverer 7, which is ISIS screening and high content microscope, and a tissue gnostics slide scanner. So we, <laughs> the, the range of what we can take is quite huge, and um, we'll be launching the, opening the first call for applications for projects in March. And I'm almost nervous to see what it is that we'll be getting as proposals, uh, all in a BSL2 lab. So yeah, we should uh, talk about it because your equipment array is very, very similar to what we have. Really, really oh, similar. fantastic. Yeah, about, really, really. And we'll talk after anyway, but it seems uncanny. Okay, great. And we, we're also open access. So we have you know, probably a dozen different external users per year coming. Uh, and then we have okay, people great. in shadow for a couple of weeks. and. Uh, but I'm going to keep moving. I'm now going to go. Actually, I'm going to go to Ben first because you're Cape Town. <laughs> yes, uh, and Ben, you're at uh, Stellenbosch. So you're both in South Africa. How well resourced are you? Yes. So we are, we are not too far away from Cape Town. And I think we are also one of the better funded universities. But our, our equipment range is quite modest. So we started in... Um, in 2004 with a wide field IX81 workhorse system that kind of we used to build the fluorescence, the, the imaging community. And then since 2011, we, we have a, a 780 system, confocus system with SIM. And then we upgraded that uh, two years later to, to Storm. So we basically brought super resolution into the academic field. Uh, and that's all on the light microscopy side. And then we have two SEMs strong, you know, on the material science with EDX detector and so forth. That's actually very important for kind of business generation in our platform. And then we have uh, a block face SEM on our medical campus geared for, you know, medical samples. But that's what we use for our correlative approaches. So light microscopy, relatively modest and also getting old. So we, we need to, you know, it's always 
very worrisome because getting new equipment is, is, is not easy and it's a long road. But that's that's our capacity and it's doing nice work. Okay, so I think this is going to be a bit different now. I'm going to go to Mahmoud. I think we've all you've already kind of insinuated what you have. What do you have up in Nigeria? <laughs> yeah, it's quite exciting uh, to hear you know the capabilities um, at the microscopy center in Cap. You know where Ben is, uh, etc. Um, <laughs> our situation is entirely different. Um, so for us, you know, in Nigeria, I think. Um, when we launched this center by RTC, we have the only, you know, confocal microscope in the entire country. Um, we have an LSM 700 in the center. And apart from that, uh, we have, um, you know, other fluorescence microscopes like Nikon I-50, Nikon I, I think. And then we've got a Z's and all Z's, you know, um, that needs to be fixed for it to be fully operational as a wide field. Um, but of course, you know, thinking about imaging, I don't like to think about a, a, a you know, confocal or a microscope itself. I also want to think about other equipment like plate readers. So we have like a fluorescent one for fluorescent plate reader. We have a Lyco Odyssey system for imaging Western blotching, fluorescence Western blotching, which we acquired last year. So in reality, in the center, we we do have some of this equipment, and um, general idea is that given that none of this is existing anywhere in Nigeria, at least the Lyco, I'm sure we don't have it anywhere in Nigeria. The LSM 700, in, you know, not anywhere in Nigeria as well. Um, so this is where we really want it to be an open access facility. You know, just like you know, Karen mentioned. Uh, while it's really important for people to let's say go to South Africa if they have this high end you know experiment that they want to do you know to use it, some of these experiments can be started back let's say locally you know and then if there is any need to take the experiment further then they can go there and also I think um, in terms of funding realities also it's not possible for example to have many people go to South Africa to do those things. And uh, this is why we are really, you know, um, trying hard now to see that we are able to meet up with the expectations in our community in Nigeria. Because one thing that I would like to mention is that over the last 10 years we trained in Africa, whenever we advertise for workshops, we receive more, over 50% of applications come from Nigeria. So probably because of our population and probably also because there are many different, many scientists. So we know that therefore with a facility in Nigeria where we are now, at least we are going to reduce that demand for people accessing that when there are workshops in other places, they will feel that we, they don't necessarily have to go there because they already have the facility there. But to be honest with you, as a conclusion, I think, um, you know, we are quite excited because, you know, it's looking very good for the community, but we have to bolster our capacity to be able to meet up to the expectations in the community. So if you are out there listening and you have a confocal or you have a white field or you have whatever, you know, do donate. And that reminds me, you know, we were recently donated an LSM 510. You could say that LSM 510 is quite an old system, you know, but this is the situation, you know, that we are. We said, oh, we still want to collect it because, you know, um, they, it will be put to good use, even though in some places you could argue that LSM 510 is quite an old system and problematic even uh, to, to, to collect, given that it's way, way, you know, not uh, maintained by Zeiss anymore and many other things. But I think for us, we have to accept whatever we are able to get to have some imaging that we can do to get the community going. And once there is more interest, we could have more support either from government and even from other, you know, external funders to improve, uh, you know, the equipment that we have. Okay, so I have a couple of really quick questions. First question is, how many researchers do you have in your institute? Um, we, the life science, bio. Not in life science, general. No, just life science and bio. Roughly, uh, I, roughly I, I, would, I would say that we have um, probably uh, 40, 50. Okay, so you've got 40 or 50 academics. If you're like York, so that means you have 25 to 30 different groups that will be wanting access to the advanced microscopes. And this is just for this puts in context, 
it's great having ABIC. It's great having that resource because actually they need to get that proof of concept data to show that they can use it and what they can do. And it just, it, 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 it opens a door. Mm -hmm. It doesn't solve the problem because, you know, up in Nigeria, you, you need this to be local. These mm -hmm. resources need to be local. And the next point, uh, which I think Karen probably wanted to come in on anyway, <laughs> you mentioned the second hand, the, the LSM 510. <clears throat> can I challenge this? Is it really a good thing to have an LSM 510? Because you get it, the circuit board will break, you then can't fix it, and you have to dispose of it. Yeah, because I, I, I'm, I, I'm not convinced that you can, <laughs> I think robust workhorse fluorescence microscope, this is easy, this is mm. not a problem. And you can get a lot done. Look, we have really old wide field fluorescence microscopes. As soon as they retire a confocal, we keep the microscopes. They go on for years. But the confocals, the service, the support, the track. If the software glitches, you're snookered. Uh, for those who are not in uh, the UK, snooker is a game like a pool <laughs> on a bigger table. Uh, and, and the challenge is to actually stop people hitting balls. It becomes a real problem. And so, Karen, I, I'm guessing you were probably going to come in on this. And Yes. Um, Peter, I, I did warn you before we started recording that you've got people in the room who can speak on this topic for hours. I have so much <laughs> that I could say in response to this. Um, the, the first one is actually um, just to, to point out that, that sort of what Mahmoud was um, touching on is sort of the ideal of what we what we want to aim for in terms of having facilities closer to where people are. So um, what we're doing with ABEC, what we're doing with the African Microscopy Initiative, um, all of this capacity development is by, I mean, ABEC is a community network and the whole motivation behind it is it's not sufficient. It's not good enough for researchers to always need to travel to, to access routine research equipment. Yes, um, at a certain point, plane tickets are cheaper than some of, the, some of the equipment out there that one can envision, but if you, if you always have to travel and you always have to be dependent on other people to use equipment, even if it's even if it's very generous collaborators, you don't have the same sort of ownership of the research that yeah. you would have if you could just go to the core facility down the corridor or two floors up. So yeah. especially with 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 uh, with AMI with the imaging center, it is to give people access so that they can drive a project, get pilot pilot data. And the idea is that they leave that facility with training. They, we've taught them how to use the microscope and with data that they can put into a publication and a grant application. Because the ideal is what we want is first hubs, something like BioRTC and nodes across the whole continent that people can access. And that needs to grow into a core facility in your institute, wherever you are. Or if you're in a at one city, sort of maybe a, something slightly decentralized across a couple of, of um, in, um, sort of universities. Um, so, so that is critical. And you're absolutely right that sort of talking about one microscope accessible by all these research groups, it's very in comparison to some of the resources out there um, in, in the global north. We've got a long way to come. And sort of we've got incredibly generous research from funders and governments in some cases, but there's there's a need for more. The, the trick is, and this is the segue, um, we need to do it in a way that is strategically smart and in a way that is also respectful to the community that is um, in on the receiving end. So, so equipment donation, for example, is a hornet's nest. Um, equipment gets donated regularly in Africa. We hear about there's a confocal sitting somewhere in Tanzania. We've never heard about it. Most people don't know it's there because it broke almost as soon as it was received. Mm -hmm. The trick with that, um, I like your snooker, <laughs> Pete, but um, for those who were excited to receive it, they are immediately disappointed because they find that they were excited for something that no longer works, that they and doesn't suit their purposes. And for anyone who hears about the donation, they now think that they're sorted. And if that system's not working and not used, it's not their problem. And it makes it harder for other resources to get sent there. Mm -hmm. So if any equipment gets sent into Africa, we need to make sure that it is usable so that it can be used. 
because otherwise you're demotivating the researchers themselves and you're removing incentives from funders to put more funding in. Uh, and that is, and it's, um, and the last point is why, why do we always need to be dependent on getting like the oldest of old scraps <laughs> from the rest of the world? <laughs> I mean, there, there's enough resource to go around that you can do a lot with the 510. You can strip it of the scanning head and turn it into a fantastic wide field that is usable for years. And often a wide field is more useful than a confocal. Sure, let's do that. But let's use the researchers using the wide field to collect good data so that they can write a grant to get a 880 when mm -hmm. they need a confocal, <laughs> or at least that's that's my ambitious uh, ideal. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I, I think there are other funding models uh, in the certainly in the northern hemisphere that could be help that could help what's going on as well. Uh, but that that would take quite a big mind shift and business change uh, to the rest of Europe uh, and to the big companies, actually. Uh, but there's discussion there. I've just realised that talking about being snookered, I've actually got my snooker cues <laughs> in my office, which is it's been so cold here in the UK that we've got a small snooker table, not a proper style snooker table. Not a, we don't have that bigger house in the garage, and the cues are so cold you can only play for about half a frame before your hands are frozen. So we brought them in so we can play a whole okay. frame. Before we have to run in again. <laughs> my son William loves playing snooker and it's a really uh, anyway it's a complete digression I have we've lost Ben for a short while because I think you had uh, power power out at the yeah. moment so I, I have a, a question for both of you it's all good and well whether it be a brand new confocal or super res microscope or even a 510 coming in it's a sustainability that's another concern because these instruments are not cheap Mm -hmm. to maintain you know, a, to service one of these per year is the price of a new car to put it in some perspective how do you how do you forge a sustainable model in the uk we charge users but the funders are giving the users the money to pay the core facility which enables us to get the to get those running costs through 50 different users 50, 60 different grants. So it's costing no one a lot of money in the big picture. Uh, and it's making it sustainable. Is this a is this a, a model that is be, be, you've it's, been able to develop? Is it a model you'd like <laughs> to develop? I, I don't know. So it's it's a huge challenge. Um even in South Africa, where we're relatively well resourced. Um we in a lot of our um grants, we are able to write um, extended maintenance contracts into the budget, uh, which is great as long as they last. And then um, ongoing maintenance is, is a problem. And we're, the, the odd thing is we're able to write the maintenance costs into a grant. We aren't able to write repair costs into a grant to, to a large extent. And a lot of researchers don't have the freedom to build in user costs. So even though we have a core facility model, a lot of our user costs are kept minimally low and they are by no means a cost recovery or even maintenance system uh, because researchers, everyone's grants are too small to, for, for that to be a realistic, if, if, if something small breaks, you can fix it. But yeah. large things, it's an ongoing problem. It's easier to get a new system often. And that's in South Africa. Okay. The rest of the, the continent is even harder. Yeah, no. <laughs> Don't worry about the money getting a new system. My all my concern is the long term costs. Personally, you know, for, for even even in the UK, it's not the purchase price; yeah. it's the running cost to make sure that we don't waste public yeah. money at that point. Yeah. Yeah. But we do have that cost. Mahmoud, is it the same in Nigeria? As well? <laughs> um. So, uh, you know, th the truth is, if I were to break it down to you, uh, the highest grant that one can get, for example, for a, a the major grant in Nigeria is about maybe 50 million naira. And if you convert 50 million naira to pounds, that's not up to 100,000 pounds. So around that's a grant. $120,000 US. Yeah, exactly. So, and that grant is supposed to fund for the research, any technician or PhD student and uh, consumers and everything. So, in reality, um, for 
public institutions in Nigeria, how, buying a high-end equipment like this is even impossible. And therefore, if you don't have the funds to buy it, how can you sustain it? In our own situation, we know that this is the major problem that uh, we, we would have to come to terms with. Uh, but in our own little way, I think uh, this is why our collaboration with, uh, or you know, being part of Trend is really, really helpful because at least in the network, and also I think this is also something that being part of AVIC would be helpful. What we are trying to capitalize on is people that have experience in using these systems, who can uh, fly to help us fix some uh, small problems, uh, you know, that are you know, that we don't have to pay for someone from, let's say, Zeiss or somewhere to come and fix it. And then secondly, one of the things that we are doing is to increase uh, capacity in open hardware. So in, in using this approach, what we're trying to do is to get our technicians, for example, to know how to, let's say, 3D print some, you know, some parts, if there's any problem to fix that, and also to troubleshoot, if you see what I mean, some of the systems so that small concerns can be managed internally. But we do know that if there is any major problem, we have to now find someone to fix it. Whether we have a solution for that now, we don't really know, but at least in our institution at the moment, we have a dedicated amount of money given to by RTC per year for maintenance of equipment or whatever. So what we may end up doing is that if there's any major problem, we may have to say, hey, Abic, can we discuss with, let's say, Zays to see if they can, if this equipment is not under maintenance by them, but can we come to a small arrangement where we can pay for this to be serviced by them? I think these are the kind of discussions that we may have to have. Okay. And, you know, I, I think the solutions are different probably for the different regions within Africa even, uh, be because the, the economies, if I look at Nigeria, if I look at South Africa, even there, the economies are very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes. it's really, I think, championing back to the importance of scientific funding, back to governments. I think that, that that's a, a key point. But I think it's important to, to get, to, to infiltrate into government, and it has to be into government, Yep. Then to understand the importance of the infrastructure to enable the researchers to develop to the cutting edge. They need access to the cutting edge applications. AVIC's beautiful, I think, in this case, because you can send researchers proof of what they can do with it. But then they need, it's that sustainability that will enable it to grow. Without the sustainability, you'll get essentially big bangs and then big busts at the end of it. You'll get your microscope, you'll have five years because you get that extended life and then it's gone again. In five years, you can't fix it. And that's, it's, it's really painful to, to see that way. I think, oh, it's so frustrating, isn't it? But I think the funders yeah. have to realize if you're going to build infrastructure, you have to put a sustainable cost model behind it. And I think by building a sustainable cost model with cost recovery, it discourages people buying they're getting their own big end instruments that aren't going to be well used. Yeah, absolutely. Which I means mean, that is going yeah. to be where the most impact is being delivered and is being supported. Uh, so it's, oh, it's, wow, it's such a difficult task. It, it, it is mean, valid. I mean, I mean uh, you know, just going back to that issue, I think for us, even the recovery is an issue because the Nigerian NERA, for example, is weak. So if, for example, you charge, we charge, you know, the intention is to charge users, but even if you charge, it's not going to be enough to be able to scatter for that. But I think one key thing mm -hmm. that you mentioned, which is really relevant, is, uh, you know, getting in a conversation with the government. So this is something that in RTC we've been uh, having, uh, uh, you know, with the government to get them to understand what we're doing and to have their support. And because of that, we have worked very closely with the teaching hospital in New York State University. And there is a lot of interest in collaboration. And for all for the for our government, it's important for them to see that whatever whatever they're trying to do has the uh, relevance to their interests. In that in our in their own case, is does it have impact on healthcare delivery? How does it help in solving this and that? 
So our collaboration with the hospital is helping. And I think it is because of that we are getting some of the support we are getting because we could do research on malaria. There are issues around kidney diseases. There are a lot of different things that the state is interested in. And with our facility, we see that we could be able to provide a platform to allow that. But one key thing eventually that would be needed is to have the researchers with the, with the fantastic questions that will be able to now do the research to immediately see the, show the government the impact of that those research for them to continue supporting us. And Karen, you wanted to come in as well. Yeah, um, a few things. Uh, Peter, you, you're, you're correct in terms of um, there are challenges and they vary across region in terms of funding. Um, uh, Ben would able be able to comment more sort of on the South Africa Oh, here he's yeah. here. Um, so welcome, ben. welcome back, Ben. Just quickly, so I, sustainability. Oh yeah. I, and all good and well having an instrument. How do you recover the service contracts, the maintenance costs of these going forward? Yeah. So, Kevin, back to you. Yeah. And I, I was just touching on. Uh, we're quite fortunate here in that there there's a, a fair amount of government funding available for this sort of thing. Uh, not as much as we would like. But there is government funding. And a lot of the African regions, there isn't any significant government funding for research. And the largest grants are coming from charities like Wellcome Trust, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and then like the NIH or the um, German government or EU funding. So it, it also means that um, research app grant applications there are written with what in with the focus of what's important to those different funders and often it's with keep in mind of what sort of Africa needs but it means that any advocacy that needs to be done in approaching funders and not sort of speaking from the perspective of ABIC it's one of the reasons why um, our focus in ABIC is on the community as opposed to finding ways that we can address all these different needs um, is that getting the community together means that we can advocate to both the international funders and charities as well as all of the different governments. Um, and it's going to have to be targeted at different strategies in each region, but it's because of everything that you say um, and sort of introducing these different models and just educating people on the type, the different types of models out there in terms of full cost recovery is not an option, but there are ways that you can get um, some some funds back to cover some of the costs of, of running this equipment because full cost recovery even in South Africa is not it's not feasible right now. I, I, I'm just enjoying this for those who are listening you'll have no appreciation of this but it, it's like one pops off so Ben disappeared come back up his pack up Mahmoud now had to leave so he'll be back hopefully in a few minutes I, but I realize we're also probably running up close to the hour mark as well and this has gone way 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 too fast. Uh, I was also, and oh, I wanted to, well, Mumu can listen to this back, can't he? Uh, sustainability. Do you ever in, invite, so AVIC is for, you've got these bursaries for not for profit, but do you. So allow, you're talking about for the imaging center or the community? The, sorry, the imaging center. So they're, they're, they're separate. They're allowing the bursaries into the imaging center. Sure. Do I, and you yourself, Ben, as well, the South, uh, South African Bioengineering, do you allow industrial commercial users to use your microscopes and if you do do you charge then an uplift a profit on that which would help offset some of those running costs um uh, because ben's recently returned i'll let him answer first sure answer first sure so that's welcome to load shedding south africa <laughs> and so of course sustainability is a massive issue and and the and the, it's so multifaceted our our university is not a good representation but the main challenges are equipment is all right funded through the state and co-funding from the university that is a good system that we have and there is funding for a service contract five years which is also very good yeah. but, the end of that. but no staff no staffing and no no um kind of uh, you know, minimum requirement for a, a applicable staff. And hence you have institutions where there's no staff, even if there is maybe some on paper or there's a postdoc for a year. So these are the challenges. And then that there is no prescribed um, business model. Yeah, we that's an excellent Bosch, point. 
we have a very strong business model. We, we must be cost effective. We must cover even the, our own salaries, which is incredibly tough because the PI's grants are so minute, Pete. Yeah. They are so minute. They are like, and I review the applications, you know, of my colleagues in the UK. They are like 5% of a UK grant. So, so sustainability is a question that we have to unpack with the government. Uh, you know, to for me, it is we need so funding support for staff scientists. Yeah. And, and I know... And that also speaks to sort of the, it speaks to the need for support for South Africa bioimaging itself, actually. There's the, Absolutely. The, the lack of support comes from the same yeah. Yeah. like root problem. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right, Ben. So actually, I, I meant to recover my salary um, and my technician's salary. So our instruments don't come with a technician. But, yeah. we, but, the, but the granting system is such that the staff cost put on it, it can, inc- can cover the technical support help as well as the depreciate as well as the service contract prices so the sustainability is and of course we'll have 40 50 different grants all paying in bits of money that pay for the technicians that, that pay for the technical experts that pay for the service the maintenance the, the replacement lenses you know i i again if you're listening Absolutely. or watching and you don't know the price of a lens and, and, and standard quality or good quality, I guess, but the standard uh, in the market, oil immersion lens is mm-hmm. probably 8,000 US dollars, 6,000 mm-hmm. pounds. Mm-hmm. It's- the, the, in addition to that, you see, uh, like at our university, we have strong PIs, you know, that bring in good grants, but we are 10% of the country's university that it's a handful of, you know, really... And so hence the other the other institutions, it's challenging to bring in the funds even for the upkeep of the utilization. So it is a really big challenge that that and hence it's so good that we are connected to global bioimaging and that we are starting with that engagement where we've seen what works, what doesn't work. We are not alone. And you know, and there is a an avenue for it. Uh, yeah, and so uh, we're speaking from a position of such luxury uh, here. You know, we, we started with cost models that weren't sustainable and that became sustainable, but the government and the funders had the money to enable it to be sustainable. They, they moved mm-hmm. the money into those grant pots to put the money where it's being used. <clears throat> but there's a the money there to start with, which I think is a fundamental difference, uh, which, which yeah. really needs to be appreciated. So and this to- uh, do you have commercial users or would you entertain commercial users if that enabled you to do, sustain the instruments for the not-for-profit researchers? Yeah, so I, I was going to say this, um, Ben, I think your facility has a different experience, but from our side, because, because I can kind of speak for two facilities, our internal facility would be accessible to commercial users and we'd be happy to charge them a uh, commercial rate. Um, but bio um, bio research in terms of from an in- industry perspective in South Africa is not a huge industry yeah it's yeah. it's slowly growing um, but at this rate it, it, it's not a large market that we can say oh yes we've got five ind- industry customers that come in a few times a year like it's it's not a thing it it at all uh, there are currently a handful of startups that I'm aware of Put yourself at the center of that development of the industry. Yeah. Explain how important the infrastructure is to these companies, because these companies can't afford to build the infrastructure themselves to develop. You've got small startups. If they can get access to your facilities, actually, from a governmental perspective, by modeling it and shaping it in that way, helps the companies, which helps build the industrial in- income, helps you, helps them helps put the taxis back and then hopefully put yourselves at the center yeah I've got I don't, ben, ben do you have much commercial uses coming in so on the light microscopy hardly and we've tried really really hard to reach out there is about once a while maybe in the with with farming to look at seeds or something but it's so limited uh so but our ems our ems uh are heavily benefiting it's luck 
in a way that we have through the EDX quantitative mapping, uh, strong, you know, good industry clients, long standing. But that is, that is, um, you know, that doesn't fuel into a light microscopy confocal based mm. system. So, yeah. And then the other issue is, of course, Pete, if I think of, you know, startups like, let's say, cytotoxicity screening or, you know, those kind of, that then you, of course, need to have the particular ISO accreditation. And so it's a whole different setup that we are also poorly equipped. I, yeah. For research, you don't need the ISO. Fine. Yeah. But, <laughs> but service. It's just, uh, we'll talk after because, again, I'll give you some ideas of where we've been got the materials industry uh, using uh, the light microscopes. They often don't realize what it can give them. And quite often it can be better than what they, what they were seeking. Because if we go right back to the start of this podcast, you talked about how a lot of people in Nigeria, especially think about light microscopes before electron microscopes. And yet in the UK, we teach electron microscopy at A levels, uh, 16 to 18 year olds, but we don't teach confocal microscopy. Mm. And yet what is a technique that is most used in the life science over those two applications so it shows how it's an educational at that point i'm amazed that you you're teaching electron microscopy to high school students i don't think we are yeah no they they when yeah. they come they all want to see the electron microscopes how the samples are prepped you know, teachers are buzzed because they like to see that engagement wow. the yeah around right the schools will bus in and see that equipment and then we show them the confocals and they're like what is this I can actually see mitochondria moving around a living cell. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's really nice to show that everything is said. The curriculum is also changing, but it's obviously a very yeah. slow moving because you have to yeah. be, it has to be a mature technology before it's probably worth getting into the curriculum. Yeah. yeah. We are way over the hour mark. I, and I was hoping my mood might make it back in. Oh, no. look at the timing. <laughs> As if it's said, it pops back in. <laughs> so we are over the hour. But I have to ask, so this is some quick answers now. So I think it'd be really cool. First of all, who are your inspirations? And I'm going to start with Mahmood because you've just popped back. You've had loads of time. So Mahmood, quick answer. Who's Who's been inspiring in your life? Quick one word answers. Uh, Professor Yusau Sen Marte, he's a Nigerian scientist who used to be in the United States uh, for years and then uh, he realized that there is a lot that needs to be done back in Africa. He returned back to Nigeria in 2010 to establish his group, despite the challenges that we have. He has been a major inspiration for me. Okay. I, I'm looking at the other two faces on the screen. And trust me, you need to watch it because they are looking, they are scrambling around thinking, oh God, who am I going to pick? So I'm going to go to Ben first to give Kevin a bit longer because Kevin, you got the first question earlier. <laughs> so my wife, no, so Karen first. No, 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 you Ben. So, so Pete, my wife would probably say I have too many heroes. So, so you know, it depends which category. I think um, in in the sciences, I might feel the cell death and autophagy. Uh, there is uh, Richard Lockshin who termed program cell death. So, have you been dying to say that. Uh, sorry, so have you been dying to say it's cell death and autophagy? Sorry, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but you know why why he is uh, an inspiration? Because he, he speaks of, you need to understand the cell as it is sick, and you know, as it is progressing. And when I visualized it through live cell imaging, mitochondrial dynamics, you know, I understood it. So that is kind of really, you know, spoke to me very, very strongly. I but I have many other people I look up to in the different fields, but maybe that would be one. Okay, Ben, thank you. And Karen, now you've had longer than anyone. Um, I'm I'm going to take a bit of a cop out because I'm I'm going to resist naming. Well, I'll, I'll name a few people. Um, I think so much to Ben. I I I I wouldn't call them heroes, but I am often inspired by the people that I work with. Um, and I have had the good fortune of working with some amazing people over the years. So a few of them you know. Um, I've worked with Ricardo Henrique and um, Sean Cully and uh, and um, Pedro Matish uh, from Ricardo's lab who are remain good friends and are always amazing and supportive to me. I currently work with uh, Digby Warner here at University of Cape Town and Michael Reichy who just are um, fantastic. Uh, Teng Yong Chu from the, the AIC. Uh, so sort of 
the the work ethic, the the perseverance, the focus, and also just the ability to the opportunity has given me to work with really good people. Um, I have to name another one, uh, Janine Schofield, who's who's fantastic. She's a South African um, stem cell researcher who who's great. Um, in terms of the the space that sort of we've been discussing today, um, a lot of my sort of inspiration and sort of guiding stars actually come from a lot of discussions with uh, with my husband, who's a clinician researcher and um, has his own experiences in um, inequalities in, in research space. And a lot of the dialogue that happens these days in terms of social justice. I'm very conscious that I am a white South African that grew up with an incredible amount of privilege. Um, to just sort of have the opportunity to be a fly on the wall for a lot of the conversations that happen around um, building equity, building capacity and social justice that are happening around the world at the moment. I've been able to learn a lot from that and I try and feed that into everything that we're currently doing. So I'm going to avoid naming names there because often it names of Twitter on Twitter, but um, I've got that. That's my, my cop up that I just sort of, I think priority people. I don't think you can't take mentioned your husband as your inspiration. <laughs> and these other two didn't mention their wives as their inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to my wife, but no, didn't say my wife. Trust me, like, you are in a lot it's of my wife. after this. You want to put us in trouble, yeah? Um, <laughs> see, I, I have the benefit of not having kids. So I can point to him and I don't have to point to the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got to say, I, I think, do you know what? I think we should do this again in the year's time because it'd be really interesting to see where it's got to. Uh, we are out of time. And I'm very conscious of that. Uh, it'd be really good to see, A, where you want to be in 10 years' time. B, where you would like, where, you, where you, I, I think it'd be different, where you would like to get to in 10 years' time, where you think you will get to in 10 years' time, and why you won't have got to where you want to get to. What would, what, what would be those fundamental difficulties? And you know, I'm going to ask, leave, leave this one last question. What is it that's going to prevent you getting to what you would ideally like in 10 years time? Uh, really, really brief, because we are out of time. And I'm going to start, sorry, Karen, but you were, you had most time last time. But over, so very, very quickly. I think my, my, my knee jerk react, reaction to that question is going to be bureaucracy and paperwork. <laughs> I love it. Bureaucracy. And I'll leave it at that. Yep. Ben? <laughs> what would prevent me? It could be only me. Uh, but, and that's very unlikely. <laughs> so. Okay. And Mahmoud? Uh, for me, it has to be funding, you know, <laughs> um, for what we do in, uh, in BATC, funding is critical for what I do here in the UK for my research, funding is critical. I think funding is a major thing. So how I wish, you know, uh, we can have that uh, wish that can come true. And that would be, you know, to have unlimited funds to do whatever we want to do. Well, let, let, let's see what can happen in the next few years. I think that's a really good focus. Uh, I think you brought out three good things is to remove the bureaucracy, <laughs> is to make sure you remain motivated and find those funding avenues to develop bio research. And it's not just microscopy at that point, you know, it's all good and well trying to find money to fund microscopes. I think funding bio research, then the microscopes come with it as well. And the researchers, that's what they need more than anything. And that's what your instruments need to develop it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I'm really sorry for the viewers, listeners. We, we have gone way, way, way over, uh, but utterly brilliantly. Karen, Ben, Mahmoud, thank you so much for joining me on the microscopies today. You've heard about Leon, you've heard about Lucy Collinson today and others, uh, so please go and listen to the other podcast. But everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. And I wish you the very best of luck and I will be there to help. Thank you so much, Bid. See you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the dash microscopists.